present. So I'm going to talk about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine complications that you've all been reading about for the last couple of months. Uh, and in particular, this idea of that we're getting seeing thrombosis in the context of low platelets. Um, so the first thing to say is that, that this story is incredibly complicated. Um, so I've, I've given a lot of talks on this over the last eight weeks to a variety of different groups and to the GPs and so on around the country. Um, and and this, this story is complicated for sure. And there's a few twists in the tail that make it very reminiscent of something that some of you may have been following over the last uh, couple of months. So, so to kind of put this whole thing in context, some of you have probably seen diagrams like this before. So this is a blood vessel in the center there. And in the blood vessel, there's a number of different types of cells. There's the red cells, which carry oxygen, uh, the white cells, which fight infection. And then there are little, these little small cells, which are called platelets that, that are involved in blood clotting that many of you will have heard of before. Um, the story today all centers on these platelets. So in a normal blood vessel, what you have is a blood vessel that looks like this with the blood flowing happily along the center. And you've got the blood vessel wall, and then you've got these other tissues that, are, that the blood doesn't come into contact with underneath here. When you get damage to the blood vessel, you get breakage in that wall. And so the blood leaks out and comes into contact with these other tissues. Uh, and that's what causes a clot to form. And in particular, what happens is that when you get damage in the blood vessel wall, the von Willebrand factor clotting protein binds to collagen, and then the von Willebrand factor tethers platelets. So the reason that we don't all bleed to death whenever we get minor injuries is that we get this, what we call a platelet plug happening at the site of the vascular injury. So these platelet cells, these, these small cells in the blood, they're key to preventing bleeding. And of course, then we have the coagulation cascade with factor eight and factor nine involved in stabilizing that platelet plug to form a proper clot. So if you think about all that, then we know that you know, platelets are playing a key role in clotting. You can see that in these kind of pictures here. They're pretty nice showing, showing the platelets and here's the, the clot fibers all around them. So in a normal healthy person, our platelet counts somewhere between 150 and 400. And a low platelet count, which is kind of referred to in the medical terminology as thrombocytopenia. Uh, makes sense that a low platelet count is associated with the risk of bleeding, right? And the lower your platelet count, the bigger the bleeding risk gets. And in particular, if the platelet count gets down less than 20 or 10, then we start getting worried about bleeding risk. So low platelets and bleeding is kind of, you know, uh, what the medical students learn. There's a variety of reasons why people have low platelets. Uh, one of the most common is something that many of you will have heard of before, a condition called immune thrombocytopenic purpur, or, or ITP for short. And this is a condition where patients, for no real reason, develop an antibody to their own platelets. So the antibody binds to the platelets, and the platelets get gobbled up in the liver and the spleen. And so because the platelet count drops, then the patients present with bleeding, uh, like petechia and purpura, these kind of small spots in the, in the legs, particularly are classical. So, so this is kind of where we're starting from, right, is the platelets are key for clotting and that low platelet counts are associated with bleeding. And you can form an antibody to platelets, which causes low platelets, which causes bleeding. Okay, so the other thing that we have to think about then is COVID-19, which looks beautiful in the photograph, right, in spite, in spite of all the angst that it's given us over the last uh, year or so. So you know that COVID-19 is caused by this SARS-CoV-2 virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, virus uh, and COVID-19 because it started in 2019, we think. Uh, we think it originated in China. Uh, now it's of course spread all around the world. So, so on the worldometer today, uh, these are what the numbers look like, more than 150 million cases around the world, more than 3 million deaths, unfortunately. Uh, the, the, the COVID is a coronavirus, and this is going to be important when we come to the vaccines. Uh, the, these viruses have been around for a long time. They cause the common flu, common cold, but they also were associated with two previous uh, outbreaks, the, SAR, the, for the original SARS uh, virus, and then the MERS virus, which caused uh, a Middle East uh, outbreak of respiratory syndrome, uh, labelled a pandemic back in March of 2020, of course. And we know how it's spread. You know, we know that, that the COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2 is spread from person to person through respiratory droplets that we then breathe in that travel down to the lungs and cause the problems. 
and we all know the symptoms. I think this is important. You know, we, we know the majority of people who get COVID-19 have got a mild uh, illness. Uh, about 15% progress to get a more severe disease, which can include pneumonia. And then some people progress to get really sick, uh, critically unwell, may progress to septic shock or multi-organ failure, respiratory failure with a mortality rate, you know, ballpark of 1%, depending on, on the kind of age and the uh, how healthy the people are who are exposed to the virus. What we don't know at all yet is why some people get severe COVID-19 uh, and why most people only get a mild illness. That's really not well characterized at all. Someone's just set off a car alarm outside my house, unfortunately, apologies. Um, so, so the main problem with COVID-19 is that the virus gets down into the lungs and when it gets into the lungs, it causes this massive inflammatory response. So we get a, what we call you know, a severe COVID-19 pneumonia and that's the primary cause of death with COVID-19. Uh, but there are other complications that we see in people with severe COVID-19. I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but right at the top there in red, you'll see that patients with severe COVID-19 have got a high incidence of venous thrombosis, blood clots, um, uh, you know, these are some, some of the data from some of the publications, the early publications are just a tsunami of these now, but, you know, upwards of 30% of patients with severe COVID-19 get deep vein thrombosis, blood clots in the legs or blood clots in the lungs, pulmonary embolism. Um, and that's in spite of the fact that the patients are on blood thinning treatment when they're admitted to hospital. Uh, so that pulmonary embolism, blood clots in the lungs are a common cause of death in patients in ICU with severe COVID-19. So blood, blood clotting is really important uh, in, the, in the whole disease process of severe COVID-19. Okay, so that's kind of background on platelets and background on COVID-19. So, so the vaccines, you, you, you're probably all aware there are a number of these around now. Um, the vaccines, in order to understand the vaccines, we have to just know two things about the COVID-19 virus. Um, so the, the two things we have to know are that it's an RNA virus. So this kind of string in the center is the RNA. And then around the surface of the virus, you've got these spike proteins, which are these pink fluffy balls. Um, so the, the, the spike protein on the surface uh, here, this is important for how COVID-19 binds to cells in the lungs and gets inside them and causes damage. And the RNA inside the virus is what, cause, what, what drives the, the replication of the virus once it gets inside our cells. Uh, so without looking at all the different structures here, the two key things are the spike protein and the RNA in the center. And so once, once the, the companies knew about the spike protein and the, and the RNA, then they set about making vaccines using technologies that they already had used for other things. Uh, so there are a variety of different ways you can make a vaccine to COVID-19, and we don't really have to think about all of them, but two of them are worth kind of pointing out, I think. Uh, so there are the mRNA vaccines, um, which is, is this one. Uh, but this is the Pfizer vaccine, which is the one most commonly used so far in Ireland, and the Moderna virus. Both have used this mRNA technique, uh, where they've got a synthetic mRNA that instructs the cells to make proteins, particularly the spike protein, uh, we make that spike protein in our bodies and then we generate an immune response to the spike protein and the antibodies that we generate to the spike protein can wipe out COVID if and when we come in contact. And the other methodology that's used to make uh, COVID-19 vaccines is to use a viral vector. Um, so these are adenoviruses uh, and this is where the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson come in. Um, you'll see that there are others out there. So the Russians have got their own and the Chinese have got your own, their own kind of variants on this, uh, both of which kind of fall into this viral vector, this adenoviral vector as well, methodology, uh, which is important when we come to doing the line. So, so the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine are the two most widely used in Ireland so far. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Pfizer vaccine is an mRNA vaccine it contains the genetic sequence for the spike protein, which is the pink fluffy balls on the surface of the, of the virus that I showed you before. And when it's inject injected, the mRNA is taken up by our own cells, which make the spike proteins. And so we get an immune response to the spike proteins, which means that we're hopefully protected against COVID-19. The AstraZeneca vaccine is a viral vaccine. So it's a rep 
recombinant replicant replication deficient chimpanzee adenovirus vector that, that they've been working on in Oxford for quite a while. And that vector also includes, includes the spike protein, although the structure of the spike protein is a bit different. Uh, and so it's effectively got the same idea is that, you know, the, the vaccine's injected, it enters the host cells, the host then makes spike protein, you get antibodies, immune response to the spike protein, and so you're protected against COVID-19. So, so the two things look very similar in many respects, I guess, in terms of how they drive the immune system. In terms of adverse reactions from the clinical trials, you know how these things all work. They go through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials before they ever get into the market, <clears throat> before they get approval. Um, so these are some of the reactions that were that were re re reported in the original vaccine trials of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Local reactions were common enough, 60%, as you can see, with redness, swelling, pain. And then some other things were associated, like tiredness, muscle aches, chills, and so on. But, but nothing, there was no real signal there, any flag that there was any potential problem. Uh, most mild or moderate in intensity resolved in a few days, and paracetamol could be given to, to cope with any of those. So this is what the vaccination in Ireland looks like. I've got these figures off the web today. So, um, you know, total number of doses, 1.6 million uh, people fully vaccinated, 450,000 in the world, 1.2 billion doses. This is for all the vaccines now, not for any particular one. Uh, so 23% in Ireland haven't seen something and 3.6% of people around the world are already fully vaccinated. Uh, and this is a similar kind of curve, doesn't go quite as recent as it's only up until the 20th of April, but you can see in Ireland total doses in purple there, uh, with first doses obviously way more than the second doses. I guess the most important part of this figure is the one on the right there, the uh, pie chart. So in Ireland, 70% roughly have, of patients have received the Pfizer vaccine and 25% uh, the AstraZeneca with a smaller number having the Moderna vaccine, which is an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer. So, so that's all good. Okay, so the twist in the story, um, there's always a twist in the story, right? So the twist in the story really started, at least for me, on Mother's Day, um, which was the 15th of March, uh, the weekend before St. Patrick's Day. And so, so the, week, the week leading into Mother's Day, there have been some stuff in the press about, uh, you know, thrombosis been associated with COVID-19 vaccination. And, you know, I don't think any of us were particularly interested in it. We thought, well, we know COVID-19 is associated with, with uh, risk of thrombosis. There was nothing really to get anyone terribly excited. The ISTH had issued a statement, I think, on the Friday before that Sunday, saying that, you know, the benefits of the vaccine far outweighed any, any risk which was likely to be negligible. Uh, but I was shopping with my wife in Dundrum and, uh, on the Sunday morning and she said to me, oh, I've just seen this in the news where the uh, NIAC have just suspended the rollout or there's a temporary deferral of the AstraZeneca rollout in Ireland from that Sunday morning. Uh, so once the shopping was home and packed away, I got on the internet and then shortly afterwards started getting contacts from people looking for uh, advice about what might be happening. Um, and so this is, this is where the whole story comes from, really. Is that there's this concept that uh, maybe there's some sort of an unusual thrombosis happening in some people after the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's where the story began. So most, most blood clots in people uh, first start off in the legs, right? And that's because the blood flow in the legs is slow. So those, those blood clots in the legs are called deep vein thrombosis or DVTs. And sometimes the blood clots in the legs can break off and then when they break off, they travel up through the, the big veins in the tummy until they get to the lungs where they get stuck as pulmonary emboli or PEs. So blood clots, you know, are common in the general population, um, especially as we get older, blood clots more and more common. Uh, but the, the, the part that kind of got me interested in all this, especially when people started sending me the case reports from, from these different countries, uh, from Norway and Denmark and Austria and Germany to begin with, uh, they, they were looking for expert opinions because the patients that they were seeing weren't getting regular blood clots in spite of what you, we were hearing on the, the RT news for a fortnight. The blood clots weren't regular blood clots. These blood clots were unusual. Uh, they were happening within a few weeks of the AstraZeneca vaccine, first dose of the vaccine. And the blood clots were unusual for two reasons. First of all, the blood clots were happening in unusual places. And in particular, a lot of them were happening in the brain 
uh, and, the, and the, the big veins in the brain uh, are called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or CVSTs. And they're also occurring in the large veins in the abdomen. So that was unusual, but perhaps difficult to be sure that there was anything really happening because we don't know how frequent those things are in the general population because they're, they're all rare. But what was really intriguing was the blood clots were associated with low platelet counts, thrombocytopenia. Now, as I spent the first couple of slides showing you, you know, low, blood, low platelet counts tend to cause bleeding because you need platelets to form a blood clot. Uh, low platelet counts are not usually associated with blood clots. It's counterintuitive or paradoxical, if you like. So, so these were the, I mean, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in the general population, difficult to know what the real frequency is, maybe one in a hundred thousand people, more common in females associate with the oral contraceptive pill. But, but again, by itself on straight, maybe, maybe higher frequency than you might expect, but, but of itself, not so surprising. Uh, people with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis usually present with headaches, uh, bad headaches that get progressively worse. And sometimes they can have visual problems or seizures. Um, but what was clear from the, um, the cases we were looking through at this stage, uh, the cases that were coming from Austria, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, were that there were 25 cases of these unusual blood clots, all of whom had happened in patients who had received the COVID-19 AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, 18 of these 25, original 25, had these cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Seven of the patients had clots that were widespread through the body. Uh, they were all in young people. The majority of them were female, and they were all presenting within 14 days of their first vaccination. But the, the, the big headline was, well, at least for me when I started looking at them, was that there was this really unusual combination of thrombosis and low platelets. Uh, and on the basis of that, the decision was taken across a number of European countries, as you all know, including Ireland, to suspend the use of AstraZeneca vaccine until we could get more detail on the actual cases um, of the patients who had been affected. Um, at that stage, you know, the EMA did release a kind of an initial press release saying that there was no evidence there was any causality between the AstraZeneca vaccine and those cases. Uh, and that the vaccine had proven efficacy for, for preventing hospitalization and death in COVID-19. Uh, so that the benefits of the vaccine clearly outweighed the risk of these, uh, of the extremely small likelihood of developing this unusual co clotting complication. Uh, and so that was the press release on the 18th of March. So that was just after St. Patrick's Day. Um, maybe that was the Thursday, I think. Um, and so the EMA advice was uh, that patients should be aware of things to look out for and the things to look out for are, you know, shortness of breath, pain in the chest or in the tummy, uh, pain or swelling in a leg, could be a calf or a whole leg. And then particularly, you know, a bad headache after the vaccine or disturbances of uh, vision, vision uh, or any bleeding or bruising as well. And the advice from the EMA was that anyone who noticed any of those, the, these after their AstraZeneca vaccine should contact their local for the local centre. And the advice from the EMA was that there should be an update to the package leaflet for the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. And so on the basis of that, <clears throat> after lots of meetings, lots and lots of meetings, uh, NIAC uh, advised NEFIT and the government that they could reinstitute using the AstraZeneca vaccine about a week, I think it recommenced, about a week after it had been discontinued. So it was the weekend after. So, so at that stage, I kind of thought I was done with all my uh, EMAs and NIACs and NEFITs and so on. Uh, but, but actually what happened was that uh, the other cases started to come in from other parts of Europe and we started to get more clinical information. Um, and so, uh, the EMA called together a group of experts from a couple, one or two experts from different countries across Europe to go through all of those cases in detail. Uh, and at that stage, it became a kind of pretty clear, I think, well, our, our opinion, collective opinion was that it was pretty clear that there was a possible link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and these unusual blood clots uh, that were associated with low platelets. 
And the data has continued to come in since then. Uh, you know, at that time when we were looking at this back around St. Patrick's Day and, and a couple of weeks thereafter, one of the one of the puzzles we had was that we were seeing these cases coming in from Europe. You know, we had when we had the um, the EMA expert meeting, we had sixty two cases to go through at that stage. But in spite of the fact that the UK had been using a, a huge amount of AstraZeneca vaccine, there were no cases reported in the UK at that time, which puzzled us. Uh, but data from the UK did come in; they were fashionably late. And so, so you know, then what we had when we sat down for the expert panel was we had sixty two cases. Uh, of cerebral thrombosis in the European Union, along with 24 of the abdominal clots, all of those associated with low platelets. 18, unfortunately, were fatal, um, all within two weeks of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and in the UK then, suddenly, as I say, they went from having none to having 79, 19 of which were fatal. Um, but that's, that's 79 cases in the context of 20 million doses, as you can see there. So what's going on? Um, you know, I can't help myself. I have to include a little bit of science. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning, you know, and, and low platelets cause bleeding. And the most common cause of low platelets, or one of the most common causes, is to form antibodies to, the, to your own platelets so that the platelets get destroyed quickly. And so you have some bleeding. That's called ITP. From low platelets and blood clots, that, that's a very unusual combination. We do see it in the clinic rarely with some incredibly rare conditions. But what's interesting is that sometimes when we give people the drug heparin, which is actually a blood thinning treatment, uh, sometimes heparin, instead of thinning the blood, actually causes people to clot. Uh, and so we've got this rare condition, which is called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, whereby the heparin causes low platelets and blood clots. And that's a life-threatening complication that happens in a small number of people who are treated with the blood thinner heparin. And, we'll, and, and, as, and, and as it's often fatal if the heparin is not stopped and we anticoagulate the patients with something else. So a lot of the things that we were seeing when we started looking at these cases uh, after the AstraZeneca vaccine looked quite similar to what we see in this condition of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, and we understand the science of what happens here pretty well. What happens is the heparin in some people binds to their platelets. You form antibodies to the heparin platelet complex. That causes the platelets to get removed fast, so you get a low platelet count. But what's key about this antibody is that it doesn't just cause the platelets to get removed, it also activates the platelets. And this is the key and unique feature of this condition is that the platelet antibody doesn't just cause low platelets, it activates the platelets and so causes blood clots. So you get this very you get this very unusual combination of low platelets, which should be associated with bleeding, but is actually associated with life-threatening blood clots. And so that's what happens in you know a small number of people after heparin, and that looks very similar to what we see after the AstraZeneca vaccine. And this is where, when I started looking at these cases on St. Patrick's Day, um, immediately I kind of thought, well. This looks very much like what's going on. And thankfully, other people across Europe have the same idea. Um, so there's a guy called Andreas uh, Greinacker, who's in, in uh, Germany, who actually does the, uh, who does the, the testing for the, for all, or testing for this heparin-induced condition in Ireland. We send our blood tests to him for this condition. And he started testing the samples on the AstraZeneca people and found that the same antibodies were present in all of them. So for reasons that we don't yet understand, it seems like some people who get this vaccine develop an antibody response, and that antibody is able to bind to the platelets and activate the platelets. And so the patients are getting platelet activation and life-threatening blood clots, as well as getting a low platelet count. So this condition is now been called VIT rather than HIT, as I told you before, uh, vaccine-induced uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia is what this glorious term is. And so, you know, this, this field moved forward incredibly rapidly. So there are now, these were the original two papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, maybe two weeks ago. And then subsequently there was another paper from London the week after. Um, so it's kind of the hottest of hot topics in medicine over the last month. So when we come to talk about using the AstraZeneca vaccine, then it, you know, it gets, it gets difficult, I guess, or the, the questions are obviously there for all of us, uh, for the general general public, really, I guess, is trying to work out, you know, the potential harms 
just like we have to consider the potential harms uh, for any medication that we use. Uh, we think that the risk of harm is higher in younger people, although we don't know why that's the case. And there's some data emerging that it may not, in fact, be the case. Uh, but, but the initial feeling was that maybe young people were at higher risk of having harm from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, you know, that, that may have been skewed by the fact that the, the, amongst the first people vaccinated across Europe were healthcare providers. And obviously there were a lot of young, healthy female nurses in that cohort. And so maybe the young, the, the young and female distribution that we see in those initial cases was skewed by the fact that we were vaccinating young, healthy healthcare professionals. Um, so that's the potential harms. Of course, then we have to weigh that up against the potential benefits. And the benefits here are preventing life-threatening COVID. Um, as you know, all know, I mean, this has kind of affected all our lives for the last year and a half. Um, and so the benefits here depend on how, how prevalent COVID is in the general population. So if you know if the risk of if the risk of COVID, if there's a high prevalence of COVID in the general population, then our risk of, of getting sick from COVID is high and our risk of needing ICU admission because of COVID are high, regardless of what age you are, you know, the benefit risk is clear. If COVID is less prevalent in the general population, then you know the balance of potential harm, potential benefits here becomes closer, particularly in young people who are unlikely to get severe COVID, uh, even if they are unlucky enough to catch it. Uh, so there's a few varieties of this figure that have been trotted around, but you know it's just the, the numbers are incredibly difficult to work on because at the low end here, the, the conditions are so rare that it's difficult to be accurate. So with all of that data that came out, you know, the uh, NIAC met again and, and, you know, I can't tell you how hard Karina and the people on NIAC are working. I've got a lot of respect for the kind of effort that they're putting into this. Um, uh, so NIAC met again and they came up with the advice that, you know, in keeping with lots of countries around Europe, that the AstraZeneca vaccine should not be given to people under the age of 60 based on that benefit to harm ratio. Uh, and so that's still where we are at the moment, I think, although it's changing hour by hour, you have to be careful with this. Uh, and so what we do, so we were, we have, we've been involved, National Coagulation Centre, well, I was involved at the beginning and then subsequently Neve's done a lot of work on this. And so we've put in place, you know, clinical guidelines for the management of any patients in Ireland who do suffer this complication. And, and now that we understand the biology, or well, we understand some of the biology that's happening, uh, you know, there are treatment guidelines that have been issued across Europe and in the States now. Uh, the key thing here is that these patients are managed with expert coagulation advice uh, because they need specialized di diagnostic laboratory testing and the treatment is very challenging and needs the use of uh, anticoagulants that we don't use very often that need specialized monitoring. Uh, so we have national guidelines in place for this that Neve is looking after that we're uh, already up with the HSE and have been spread around the country and we're having weekly meetings with haematologists around the country to try and keep everybody on board with all of this because it's moving so fast. Okay, you probably all heard this quote from uh, from Ted Hastings in the series just recently. It's one that my granny used to say fairly, fairly regularly up north too. Uh, can we move this forward? So are we done yet? Well, no, we're not done yet, unfortunately, um, because if you cast your mind back to the stuff that I said at the very beginning, um, you know, it's not the, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine isn't the only adenovirus vector. There are two, well, there are three others that we want to think about. There's the Janssen or the Johnson & Johnson vector, which has been widely used in America. And then there's the Russian vector and the Chinese vector. Um, there are differences between these, but they're all adenoviral vector related. And uh, after all the European stuff had come out, uh, the Americans, uh, the CDC in the States came out with this report, reporting a similar observation in patients who had received the Janssen Johnson Johnson vector, who also were getting this unusual cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with low platelet count. Uh, six reports were in the initial one of the numbers have gone up uh, after 7 million doses of the vaccine had been administered, as opposed to no cases so far after the Pfizer vaccine. I think that's still right, but again, then these, these things are moving so fast that a case could have cropped up. And so the cases that they saw in the States after the Janssen Johnson Johnson 
uh, vaccine look exactly the same. You know, youngish people, first couple of weeks after the vaccine, maybe a female predominance with the same provisos regarding who got the vaccine. Um, and but what I did find was interesting the CDC that I hadn't heard before uh, was actually, if you just look down the bottom of this slide, that there was one case of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which had been observed in the phase three clinical trial of the Johnson & Johnson factor in a 25 year old healthy young man who got a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and was subsequently found to have these antibodies. So I guess the signal was there in the phase three trials, if, but it, it wasn't, wasn't kind of uh, picked up. So we're away in Ireland as of, well, I think today, although I haven't been, I'm not in the uh, NCC this week, but my understanding is that we, we wrote a paper last Friday with four cases and I think there's been one more since. So there are five cases in Ireland. I don't think well. Four, I know four of the cases are better. I don't know what's happened to the fifth case, but we. I don't. Th I don't think we've had any deaths yet. Um, but some of you will have seen in your morning papers this morning that um, there is this possibility that uh, you know the government are looking at whether the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson Janssen vac vectors uh, will be approved for people under the age of forty uh, because of the fact that you know we we have to consider this uh, benefit to harm ratio for everyone. Uh, and I think that's, you know, I think the cabinet are discussing that actively as well, I don't know if, as we speak, but certainly over these next few days. Um, so, so that's kind of the story. I, I think you can see it's, it really is a complicated story. And, you know, I, I've got a good understanding of the hematology aspects of it, I think, and the coagulation aspects of it and what's happening and, and hopefully what we can do if anyone in Ireland gets this complication. What I don't really have a good handle on and won't be able to advise you very well on is uh, you know the public health implications of this because that's not what I do. Um, but you know there are questions here that we have to think about. You know what is the true incidence of the complications that we're seeing after the AstraZeneca or the uh, Johnson and Johnson Janssen vectors? It's difficult to know for sure. Are we really getting the true numbers? And you know some of the data we have in Ireland already suggests that that patients may be presenting with different kind of presentations. So maybe not everyone goes all the way to get a blood clot in their brain or their tummy. Maybe, maybe some people are getting kind of uh, some clotting activation, but doesn't go that far. We don't know why the blood clots are happening in the brain and the tummy with these unusual sites. And unfortunately, we've got no way of identifying people at increased risk of developing these clots after these vaccines. Uh, you know, we've been using heparin for 50 years and we have no way of identifying who gets this kind of this complication after heparin yet. So the chances that we're going to be able to identify people at risk after the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Janssen vaccine are small. Uh, in terms of optimal treatment strategies, things are a lot better now because, as I say, we we understand a bit about this condition and, you know, the high mortality that we saw particularly in Norway and in Austria and Germany at the beginning, uh, that I think those, those deaths will, the death, the numbers of deaths will decrease even if the number of uh, blood clots doesn't. You know, there are no reported cases from Russia and China yet, but, well, you know, that may be reflecting local reporting, I guess, or maybe if the vaccines are different, we don't know, time will tell. Uh, and we don't know why the thrombosis that we're seeing is happening with the AstraZeneca and Janssen adenoviral vectors, which are encoding the spike protein. But the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which also encode the spike protein, don't cause the same or don't appear to cause the same risk of thrombosis. So, so you know, the story's got a long way to go, I think. And so, you know, practical advice in all of this, uh, where, where these vaccines fit vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, patients with haemophilia and uh, people with bleeding disorders. I think, I don't, I don't really, I think, I think the best I can do for everyone on the call is to point you towards this paper with haemophilia, which you can see Brian was a co-author on, but comes from uh, World Federation and Declan, uh, World Federation and he had EHC, NHF. So this, this is like, it's only a couple of pages and I think it's a great read and, uh, uh, it's incredibly well written, I have to say. Uh, but you know, here's some of the kind of things that have been flagged in it. Uh, and I think these are all really good points. Uh, some people will have doubts about the efficacy and safety of vaccines or don't acknowledge that they need to be vaccinated. You know, that, that holds for the general population for all of us. Uh, and people with haemophilia or bleeding disorders are no exception to this reality, which is absolutely true. 
Um, people with hemophilia are not at increased risk of contracting COVID-19 or developing severe COVID-19. And consequently, they're not going to be prioritized, not going to be considered de facto a priority group for vaccination. Local selection rules will apply. And, and I'm, I'm sure all of you know that's what's happening in St. James's. Um, we've got no reason to select a particular type of vaccine for anybody at this stage. Uh, and so that also holds for people with bleeding disorders because we don't we, we don't know what how we would select out the people at risk of this rare complication. Uh, this adenovirus that's used in these vaccines is not related to the you know the AAV that's used in gene therapy trials, so there's no concerns there, and there's no evidence that any RNA vaccines uh, trigger inhibitor development in patients with hemophilia. But you know we've never we've never used vaccines on these scales, so we probably have never had a chance to see before. Uh, and the practicalities of it, you know. Uh, Pressure should be applied to the injection site for anybody who's got a bleeding tendency for 10 minutes after the injection. We should look at the injection site. And if there's any suggestion of you know, concerns or a hematoma developing, then you know, get in contact us with the NCC. That's always the default. Uh, for patients who have got factor eight or factor nine or VWF levels, activity below 10%, then the recommendation is that we should treat before the vaccination. Again, contact NCC for that. Uh, for patients at levels above 10% or, or those who are on emicizumab, where we think we've got an equivalent level above 10%, then no hemostatic treatment hopefully required. But again, uh, you know, the pressure and observation is important. Uh, and then for patients with the rare bleeding disorders, you know, discuss with NCC, uh, but there are no specific, uh, no specific contraindications for vaccination. So, so I, you know, all I can do is reiterate all that advice, which uh, I think it's first class. So conclusions then, I've tried to give you some idea of, you know, the, the story and, uh, and how fast it's moved forward about the vaccines and the blood clotting complications. In spite of what people, all the non-experts were trotting out in RTE for the first couple of weeks, we don't see an increase in thrombosis after AstraZeneca. What we see is an increase in this incredibly rare but unusual type of blood clotting where the platelet count is low. Uh, instead of being high. Uh, I think we're going to need more data to be sure that there's a causal link here. You know, we've never tried to vaccinate so many people before, but, you know, over the course of March, as I, as I looked at all those case reports coming in from Europe and all the details, I, my gut feeling is that there's a link here and there, there, there probably is a causality, even if we don't know why yet. Uh, this field, field is moving very, really very rapidly. I think the key thing for all of us, you know, people with bleeding disorders and people without bleeding disorders is that when they're having the vaccines that they know what they're looking out for. And I'm not just the public are aware, you know, but that the emergency departments around the country are aware of what they're looking out for, because if they get plugged in quickly to exp expert advice, uh, you know, uh, I'm, hope I'm hopeful that, you know, the number of deaths will be small, but not zero. And, and this is a point that Brian made to me a couple of weeks ago when we were chatting is, you know, there are not many benefits to this story, but the one benefit, I guess, for people with bleeding disorders is that this is for sure highlighted to all the powers that be around the country, the importance of having a national co coagulation centre uh, where this kind of expertise is available for NIAC and EMA and NEFIT and UDA and UVF and INLA and whoever you like. Uh, you know, there is, an, there is an advantage to having uh, a collection of anoraks in the NCC. And with that, I'll leave it there and be happy to I'll try and answer any questions.